Welcome back again. This time we are going to be learning about proteins that are found within or and attached to the plasma membrane. So let's get started. You may have learned a little bit of this in anatomy, but we're going to go in a little bit more in depth. Okay. Uh, so previously, um, we've talked about integral versus peripheral proteins, where integral proteins are the transmembrane proteins. Their amino acids are attracted to the internal region of the cell membrane, so they go the entire thickness of the cell membrane. Um, as opposed to peripheral proteins whose amino acids are attracted to structures on the surface of the cell membrane, some of them are the external surface, and some of them are the internal surface. Now, both types can be enzymes, both types can be transporters, um, but we're not really gonna spend that much time talking about peripheral proteins. There are so many hundreds of different kinds of these. So we're gonna talk about some of the most common integral proteins so that you can understand um, what they do. I don't know how I went backwards, okay. So first, let's look at the three types that, of integral proteins that do transportation. The first is called a channel. And a channel basically is a hole that goes all the way from the extracellular matrix to the cytosol on the inside. And so you're going from one water environment to another water environment. So we say that the hole or the inside of the channel is hydrophilic. And so anything um, that's hydrophilic can go down its concentration gradient and go right into the cell, no energy input. And this one, we can have very rapid moving ions as in the millions per second. Now, in contrast to that, we have what's called a carrier protein. Occasionally they are by themselves. So typically they bind to an another molecule that's attached in the plasma membrane. They also carry, um, substances down their concentration gradient. Um, so there's no extra energy needed. They're just using the energy from the difference in the concentrations. And um, oftentimes they may pull another solute with them and that other solute was actually going uphill rather than downhill, but there's enough energy in the downhill molecule to pull the other one uphill with it. And so these have an intermediate speed around a thousand of these ions can move per second. And the third one is one we call a pump. And this only does uphill transport. So energy is always required. And each pump is very specific for only one ion. Okay. And in order to maintain the gradient, it has to be active 24 seven. It can't just work when certain things are happening within the cell. It really needs to build up the concentration gradient. And this is by far the slowest of the three types of transport program, pro, uh, protein, sorry, at only about a hundred ions per second. Now looking at the channel proteins, the first type that I talked about, we actually have four different kinds and I wanna introduce the names of those because two of the names you're just gonna hear repeatedly throughout the entire course of physiology. Um, the first one I wanna talk about is called a leakage channel, also known as leaky channels. And basically what happens is they are closed and they open up randomly and then they close and then they'll randomly open up. And some of them actually can be open almost all the time and only close um, for seconds at a time. Um, but when they are opened, ions can go down their concentration gradients. No energies involved. One you're going to hear a lot about is a ligand gated channel, or maybe you want to call it a ligand. I don't, doesn't really matter to me. And all a ligand is, is a small molecule that's going to interact with this channel protein. And after the ligand binds to the, pro, the channel protein, it changes shape. Okay. And so we got a great picture of a good example here at the bottom. This actually is the plasma lemma, the sarcolemma on a muscle. And here we have a ligand gated channel. And what you'll notice is the little red triangles are acetylcholine. And when two acetylcholine molecules bind to the ligand gated acetylcholine receptor, essentially what's going to happen is that channel is going to open 
And then we're going to have sodium enter the cell going down its concentration gradient at the exact same time. We're going to have potassium exit the cell going down its concentration gradient. And yes, we can have extracellular calcium come into the cell down its concentration gradient as well. So the ligand gated channel, we talk about a lot when we do muscle contraction, but there are other ligand gated channels we're gonna talk about. Mechanically gated channels are similar, but it's kind of like they have um, a top on them like you would find on a manhole cover. And what happens is when there's mechanical pressure on that cover, it kind of gets pushed off to the side. And so now the opening to the channel can be seen and ions can go down their concentration gradient. So this is one um, that you may have where you're going to have cells that undergo mechanical or physical stress. And the last one is a very common one. We talk about it all the time in the nervous system as well as in the skeletal system, and that is a voltage-gated channel. And what's happening here is the cell is at the resting potential. So think your typical minus 70 millivolts. And when the nerve impulse comes down, it depolarizes, it, it loses its negativity, and that loss of negativity is enough for that channel to open and that's going to let sodium enter the cell. So as you can see this fourth one and the second one, I both gave examples of sodium enter the cells and they both have something to do with the neuromuscular junction of muscle contraction, but they're totally different types of channels. One is voltage gated and the other one is um, ligand gated. And if you're thinking, is this how calcium gets into the terminal bouton? You would be thinking correctly. All right, going back to types of integral proteins, another type is a cell surface receptor, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, on the surface, on the external surface of the cell, there is a receptor in the transmembrane protein where some type of molecule can bind. Okay, so it's a ligand receptor. And some of these are going to cause what we call signal transduction to occur. And what this means is when that signaling molecule, when that ligand binds to this, the surface of this receptor inside the cell, there are molecules that are going to then start doing something else. So basically this binding is a signal to stuff inside the cell, it's going to respond and something's going to happen. And so um, we'll be talking about this again when we come back to the endocrine system. Almost done. Cell identity markers enable cells to talk to each other. So on the surface of the cell, we have a lot of these proteins that have glycoproteins attached to them, which basically mean We've got short chains of sugars, usually branched, but not heavily branched, and they're usually pretty short. And some of these serve as tags that other cells can recognize them. So the classic example and one that we are going to study this semester is in our immune system. We have this whole group of these markers called MHC markers, which stands for major histocompatibility complex. And this is how our immune cells can look at a cell and go, Yep, you're part of this person, you belong here. Or they go, mm, no, you're foreign. Or they go, oh, you're damaged. Or, oh, you're infected. And so those categories in the immune cells know attack. Whereas the one that go, yep, you belong here. They're going to go, we'll see you next time. And they go on their merry way. And that's the last type of integral protein I want on this page is the enzyme. Well, we've talked about these before. I just want to point out that when we have an enzyme in the cell membrane, it can facilitate a reaction inside the cell as shown on this picture, or it can facilitate an extracellular reaction. And it just depends what the enzyme is, which one it can do. Almost done. Anchoring sites. So hopefully you this makes sense, these last two, because we 
when you learned about the cell and anatomy and you learned about the cytoskeleton, the scale, and you learned about how cells attach to each other, the anchoring site proteins are the ones that are going to keep the small filaments, all the cytoskeleton within the cell, they're going to be attached. And so that gives some shape to the cell and a little bit of sturdiness. And in addition, on the outside of the cell, where we have the extracellular matrix, if you remember that matrix is cells and ground substance, and ground substance has three different kinds of protein fibers in it, then you would understand that those protein fibers extracellular could also be attached to these protein types. And as you can see in the picture on the left, but not on the one on the right, sometimes peripheral proteins will also be involved in attaching to those cytoskeleton elements. And the last one are cell adhesion proteins, just what the name says. How do cells stick together? So think of the three types of intercellular junction. You can look at the stylized drawing of them on the right, the tight junction at the top, the anchoring junction or the desmosome in the middle and the gap junction at the bottom. And you can see they're all totally different from each other, but what they have in common is they are all integral proteins and they all are making two cells attached to each other, but each is for a totally different purpose. All right, so now that I ran through this, I suggest that you stop the video at this point. I, this, I love this picture. It has nine different examples of integral proteins. I only talked about eight different types, so one of them is going to be used more than once. So go through and see if you can figure out which one is which before you continue. Okay, thank you for doing that. I want to talk just for a moment about what we call second messenger systems, because so far we've talked about, oh, something's binding to it and then it's causing the reaction for whatever it is we want. But in a second messenger system, what happens is the messenger is bringing a message to the cell, but it can't get through the plasma membrane because of a, a variety of reasons. So what it does is instead, as seen on the left of the picture, it binds to a transmembrane receptor, one of those proteins. And when it binds to it, it's going to trigger a series of events. Could be as few as six events, could be several dozen events. And that's going to involve some peripheral proteins on the inside of the cell as well. We're gonna study the specifics of these when it is relevant for the organ systems that we're studying. But I just want you to realize that right off the top, there are three different ones that I know we're gonna talk about. The first involves, which is what this picture is, has to do with cyclic AMP. And if you look at it, cyclic AMP is activating a protein kinase, which means some phosphorylation is going to be going on. Another example of one has to do with the production of nitric oxide. Um, and this one is important both for people like with angina, they're taking the nitroglycerin, which actually causes the production of nitric oxide. Or for gentlemen with impotence, this is how the little blue pill is gonna work. So we'll go through in detail later on. And so what nitrogen oxide is going to do is cause the production of something called cyclic GMP, not cyclic AMP, but that also will activate a kinase, only this time it's gonna be called protein kinase G. And the third one is totally different and it is something called phospholipase C, which then gets broken down into two different second messengers, which do two totally different things, which we'll talk about. And one of those is called DAG and the other one's called IP3. But that's enough for now. Just want you to realize we are going to be hitting second messenger systems later on. So it's important that you understand what the overall concept is. So when it comes to cell signaling, and we think of the endocrine system. This is the classic example of cell signaling where a cell releases a hormone, it travels in the blood to wherever the target organ is, and then that it binds to its receptor there. Now, there may be second messenger systems involved in those distant target cells, or it may cause directly something to happen. We'll learn that when we use the endocrine system. But in addition to this endocrine signaling, we have two other categories. 
the next one is called autocrine, auto as in self. And this one's really cool. The same cell that is releasing the chemical signal has the receptor. So as soon as it releases it, it comes and it binds the receptor on that cell and it causes a reaction. So ladies, this one, the smooth muscle that makes up the wall of your uterus secretes something called prostaglandins. Um, and the prostaglandins will then bind your receptors on the smooth muscle of your uterus, which causes it to contract. And that's what gives you your menstrual cramps. So if you don't want the pain of menstrual cramps, you just take something like a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like Motrin or Aleve or Advil, because that blocks the prostaglandins from being released, as we will see later on when we study in detail. And so I understand those medications are also for pain relief, but this is much better than Tylenol because Tylenol is not going to do the pain relief, whereas your prostaglandins are going to be blocked by these non-steroidals. So you won't even get the pain associated with them. And then the third type is paracrine. So endocrine was far distances, autocrine was self, and paracrine is like very nearby, okay? Um, we have a lot of these in our intestinal tract we'll learn about. And the other place we have them um, is when we have a place of injury and we're going to have an inflammatory response. We have a certain cell type we'll learn about, which releases the chemical histamine, which you may have heard of antihistamine. So antihistamines block this release of histamine. And so the antihistamines will prevent the inflammatory reaction that would normally be occurring because of the release of histamine. So with that, we are done with this section. And thank you once again for all your hard work and I'll see you shortly for the next video.